certain that women would be accepted because no one expected women to apply. Right. This was the same time that footprints were being left on the moon for the first time. That's incredible. Astronauts up in the sky and the whole idea of aquanauts in the sea. Well, it got a lot of attention from the public at large. Mm -hmm. They did not really expect women to be a part of the action, but when some of us did apply, we had a lot of time underwater. We had credentials as scientists or engineers. And the leader of the program said famously once he realized that there was a potential for having more than just men, mm -hmm. maybe a, a team of women, he said, well, half the fish are female. Right. Half the birds <laughs> fly, they, you know, they're mixed <laughs> mm -hmm. men and women in the sky, or at least boys and girls, male and female, however you want to frame it. Why not have a few women? Right. How so exciting they, they was it? I mean, it lo I have to tell you, I've always loved the sea, and I've always loved to swim. I've never gone deep diving, but I've done snorkeling all over the world. And I, I think it's beautiful. What You know, the photography in the film is just gorgeous, you know, what they capture. Um, did you, I mean, you loved it as a child, I saw in the film. You that you talked about how you when you were a child, you, loved the, you always loved the ocean. But was there ever a time where you met, like, a dolphin or an animal that you actually befriended? I mean, it really doesn't talk about anything like that. But that's my, my actual interest. Um, did you ever meet, do like, dolphins and see them many times, the same dolphins, or swim with dolphins, or any? Part of, part of what you gain by spending a lot of time in the ocean, especially when you go back to the same places repeatedly, or when you stay, as I have, like... <clears throat> for a week or two weeks in one place. Mm -hmm. You really do get to know individual animals, individual fish, individual turtles, individual sponges. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. sponge is different from every other one. Even, you know, coral heads are different. Every one. They might look superficially to be kind of all alike, but when you really look at them, no two are alike. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a time in, in the 1970s when a wild dolphin began to engage people on an island in the Bahamas. Oh. He was a lone dolphin, which was unusual for his species. Usually mm -hmm. you see hundreds, sometimes thousands of these dolphins of that, of that kind mm -hmm. together. But this was just one apparently lonely dolphin that got separated from the rest of his family, right. whatever. And went back and forth along the area of uh, San Salvador Island in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And a friend told me about it about the same time that I was writing a book for the National Geographic, or a piece of a book anyway. And they commissioned me to go and check out this dolphin. Oh, wow. How and exciting. And I did. And it was true. You'd go along a little part of the shore, and this dolphin, and they named him Sandy, because it was a place they called the Sandy Beach. Oh, I've heard about him, actually. And, and Sandy the dolphin would come, when he hear, heard a, a, a motor come by, an engine, a boat, or he'd just somehow come bounding over from the distance and swim around the boat, you'd stop the boat, you'd jump in the water, and oh, he was just so pleased to see a fellow mammal that appeared. Oh. So I took my kids out of school for a week, mm -hmm. took them there, and every one of them has as part of their special memories they tell me that week that we had in the Bahamas swimming with Sandy the Dolphin. My younger daughter was so petite at the time that she wrapped her little fingers around the dolphin's dorsal fin and and he just thought that was the most wonderful thing. He had this human being. It was like the images you see on on some of the old Roman coins, you know, the little boy and the dolphin in this case a little girl. Like a flip like flipper kind yeah. of right <laughs> I'm not sure it was a good idea to mm -hmm. actually reach out and, and actually touch Sandy, but mm -hmm. she was such a little girl, and and she was just snorkeling and and he and he liked he was, it. He seemed to be so happy. Oh, uh, that's and, so cute. Anyway, and then my older daughter, long golden, red golden hair, and Sandy just found that irresistible. Really? He'd take her little strands of her, uh, swim up to her and just take the, the, her hair, <laughs> and my molten gold and mm -hmm. just run it through his teeth. 
Really? Like, mm. Oh, that's it's so like, cute. It tastes like a silk. <laughs> and he, he just seemed to be so curious. And my son, he was a little child, uh -huh. was, he, he said, you have no idea, Mom, how difficult it is to be your son, but <laughs> I love being able to go swim with Sandy the Dolphin. That's one of his treasured memories. Uh -huh. That's fantastic. Is Sandy the Dolphin still around? Is he still alive? Sandy disappeared about a year after we had those life-changing oh. experiences. Oh, no. One hopes that he got reunited with his family. With his family. But he, it was unusual for a single dolphin of that kind to be, and he seemed to seek out the company of humans. And right. He certainly recognized some at more than others. I mean, there are people who died there all the time, and they engaged mm -hmm. Sandy, and he would, if there were ten people in the water, he'd go back to his special people. And oh, yes. Really, yeah, That's developed cute. that rapport. But That's you know what? Fisher intelligent and responsive too. Absolutely. They get to recognize those who mean them harm and sure. those who come with a... Did you ever get um, afraid of the sharks? I know you swam with sharks. You know, they... I've, I've been in the water at times with hundreds of sharks. Right. It didn't frighten you in the beginning? In the, in the early years of diving, I was told to look out for sharks. There are man-eaters out there. And mm -hmm. it was only when I realized, oh, I don't have to worry about Man eaters don't qualify. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, but actually, it was over time that I began to see they're really not interested in humans. I mean, they're sometimes curious. They'll come over, and maybe two occasions in thousands of hours of diving and many mm -hmm. thousands of encounters with sharks that I have been apparently of some interest to mm -hmm. the sharks in question, as maybe uh, that could be a snack. Right. And they very quickly got discouraged when I showed that I was not really interested in getting eaten. I bopped one on the nose with my flipper and he took off. Really? Oh, wow. And it's like in Jaws, they make it seem like they're, like that's their sole purpose. You know, those those films are all not true then. What you're, you're well, saying. it I mean, is true that sharks are carnivores. Yes. They're meat eaters. Right. And to them, you might think, wow, there's a juicy piece of meat. Mm -hmm. But we're not really on their menu. They have other ideas about what's edible, for the most part. Right. They have certain fish that they prefer. Mm -hmm. And, or in case of great white sharks in most areas, they'll they'll go after things like little sea lions or whatever. Uh, but it's well, a part of the food chain. <laughs> yes, exactly. Did to, you? Did to you... humans, mosquitoes are part of the food chain. Oh, I know. <laughs> I had one experience with one this actually this morning. <laughs> But it's no longer around. <laughs> you are. And I am, thank goodness. Well, they carry all kinds of diseases, so it's dangerous. But, I mean, it's it's minor compared to what some of the things that you've seen. It's uh, What you've been through is just fascinating to me. You have such an exciting life. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting. Well, what baffles me is why everyone isn't just <laughs> embracing every minute of every day. Mm-hmm. As if every minute of every day is precious, right. because it is. Being alive is a gift, and now in particular, for at least some of us, we have access to food. We don't have to spend the majority of our time trying to find or grow or process food mm -hmm. to take care of our daily and long-term needs. Well, we've gotten pretty good at growing things, just to, and that's why there's seven billion of us. Some of us are still f focused on taking wildlife as a source of food, mm -hmm. and we have to think about the limits of how much we can extract before those systems become unraveled. Actually, some of them have become unraveled in the ocean, which is part of the message of the Mission Blue film. Mm -hmm. Now we can see what we're doing to the natural world that keeps us alive. On the forests, forests on the land, forests in the sea, the seagrass meadows and the, the mangroves along the shore, the, the miniature forests of phytoplankton, the small plant, plants in the sea. There are many of them so small that we didn't even know of their existence until 1986, when a new method made it possible to 
discover something called Prochlorococcus. We should have them in headlines everywhere. Have you heard about Prochlorococcus? Because it generates 20% of the oxygen that we breathe. One in every five breaths you take come from this one kind of microscopic organism in the sea whose existence was unknown to us until the late 1980s. I mean, what else is out there that we don't know about, that we need to care about, to shape our behavior in such a way that we show respect for those systems that keep us alive? Mm -hmm. They've been keeping us alive all this time, now we have to keep them alive. So what can people do to help save the ocean? Well, I'm pleased with the artists and the filmmakers, the cameramen, who have used their talents to make a film that can communicate to a much wider audience the importance of using whatever power you have as an individual, whatever it is. No, no individual can do everything necessary to save the ocean or trees or bears or sharks or whatever it is. But everyone can do something. We all have power. Little kids have power. They can influence the people around them, especially their parents and their teachers and their, their fellow, you know, their, their friends. Mm -hmm. And we now have means of communicating so that even if you don't move around very much, you can access the world, both inputting information that can shape your thinking and make you an informed human, an informed mm, powerhouse, and then you can turn it around and share your views with the rest of the world, people on the other side of the world, something that is unprecedented. We couldn't do this when I was a child. Much that we now can do was impossible to achieve even ten years ago. So there's a companion book with the film. It's mm -hmm. called Blue Hope, the National Geographic has published. It's another way of communicating to get to people. It's much more personal. Where you hold it in your hand, you look at the pictures, you might read my essays, uh, coupled with the film that touches people in different ways. What can individuals do? Hold up the mirror. Ask yourself, what am I good at? What do I love? Mm -hmm. What do I care about? Whether it's directly in the ocean or something on a mountaintop or among people in a city, whatever it is, it all connects to the ocean. Right. And it all connects to people everywhere. We all have power to make a right. difference. That's, that's fantastic. Well, thank you. Now, people ha um, can see the movie on Netflix. Yes. And also, isn't it playing in um, a theater as well? It's playing in the city or? August 15th. It's launching today. in New York and Los Angeles. Okay. Theaters, in a theater to make it possible to just go in, get your popcorn, sit uh -huh. down, and get a transformed view of the world. Mm-hmm.